Hi, Dominic Steele here, and I chair Liberty Christian Ministries, and we're about serving the same sex attracted Christian, helping to live in a biblically faithful way. To that end, we're really excited that Ed Shaw is coming to Australia in August. We've got him speaking at three significant events that are going to be live streamed. On Tuesday, the 20th of August, it's a full day conference creating a biblically faithful, inclusive church. And I hope that you can come or be part of it via live stream and bring your whole church staff team and leadership group. On the Wednesday night, it's an evening for your community group, either on the live stream or at Moore College in Newtown. And we're just opening that up and Ed's gonna be talking about what does Jesus have to say about our sexualities. And then on the Friday night, it's an evening for youth. And uh, Jesus is good news for a rainbow world. It's at St. Paul's Carlingford or network via live stream to your youth group. Ed Shaw, the author of The Plausibility Problem, he's coming to Sydney for one week in August, and I hope you can be part of it. Dominic Steele here for The Pastor's Heart, and today we're talking resilience in ministry. Uh, now, we have people watching, listening to us around the world, but in my circles, there's been what I'd call a spate of resignations of ministers from senior roles over the last few months, ministers of significant teams, largest churches, who've surprised many of us by resigning and switching roles to become team members, ministry teams, or chaplaincy, or something like that. And there is a conference coming up in August dealing with the whole issue of resilience in ministry. And uh, I've invited two of the key presenters uh, of that conference, uh, Paul Grimmond, the uh, Dean of Students at Moore Theological College in Sydney, and also Kirsty Bucknell. And uh, Kirsty, you're an organisational psychologist right. and just finished a research master's on this whole area of resilience in ministry and just about to go into a PhD. That's right, that's right. <laughs> um, but before we come to them, if you could help us get the word out on The Pastor's Heart, uh, if you're on the Apple Podcasts, it'd be great if you could give us a review or a rating. Uh, if you're with us on YouTube, it'd be terrific if you could subscribe. Uh, but particularly, if you could let friends in ministry know about uh, The Pastor's Heart, uh, we're trying to serve senior pastors, but also anyone on the pastoral staff and, and senior leaders in the church. Um, it was lovely, actually. I was in uh, Capitol Hill uh, in Washington uh, last couple of weeks ago and uh, speaking to the preacher there, and he said how helpful the pastor's heart had been in stimulating uh, thinking in, in his ministry. And uh, it's great for us to know that our little efforts here are being helpful in serving you wherever you are around the place. Now, Paul, Kirsty, thanks for joining us. Um, Paul, if we start with you, I think the last time I saw you, <laughs> you and I, we were both speaking at a conference on how life had got too much for us yep. eight or nine years ago. Yep, that's right. And um, and that in the resilience tank, it felt like we had nothing left. Yep. And uh, we're on the pastor's heart. So why don't we start with a little of your heart on that? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's a story that I've told a few times before yeah. in various places. Um, but, it, you know, it's, that, it's the reality of uh, grinding away in ministry, uh, wanting to see Jesus glorified, wanting to see gospel growth happening, uh, feeling the stretch of financial difficulties, of managing a large staff team, of having people with pastoral issues and whatever. And I just think what happened to me was that I, I, I don't think I had all the skills in place in order to kind of understand myself. I just got slowly, year by year, what I noticed was I'd start the year, I'd run really, really hard. My big break was over December. That was the mm. one time in the year that I got a kind of decent break. And each year at the start of the next year, I think I felt like I, if I was here this year, I was then here the next year and then here the next year. And just slowly over time, it felt like my soul was kind of being ground out by the demands of the job, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. As you reflect theologically, um, I mean, obviously there are skills and we're going to talk about some of those skills in a moment, but theologically what was going on and what could you have had, how, how do you assess things? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. One of the things that I've been reflecting on is that um, I think uh, I'm not sure that I'd thought deeply enough about the place of my own sin uh, and how the gospel situates me in relationship to my own sin and weakness. Um, so I think that there were habits of life that I had 
things like avoiding conflict or so wanting to please people that I couldn't say no at certain points in time. Um, all of those things were little drivers that affected the way that I responded to people when they asked me to do things, uh, affected the way that I thought about my job and my task and all of that kind of stuff. There, there, so I think there were deep things about who I was that I needed to tackle, but I'm not sure that I had any way of engaging with those and so I just basically ran away from them. How can you learn that apart from going through it and getting hurt and working out I need to fix it? Yeah, I mean, I think at one level you can't completely. Like I think experience is a driver and I don't think that you can just learn this stuff in abstract. Um, but I do think that you can probably at least have some categories in your head that help you to engage with those things in more helpful ways when you actually experience them. Mm. Um, so for example, for me I think um, you know, if you think about the gospel and what does the gospel say about your sin, forgiveness is one of the big categories that we have, mm -hmm. right? So that picture in the Psalms of God has placed my sin as far as the east is from the west. Yep. And there's, there's a lovely thought, isn't there, about being separated entirely from my sin. God's not going to treat me according to my sin. There's something really precious about that. Uh, but the, on the flip side, in the hands of sinful people, what that means is, well, I just want my sin over there and I want to be over here and I don't want to have to engage with it or contemplate in any way, shape or form. Mm. Uh, whereas the gospel, I think, gives us other resources that say, mm. you know, Colossians 3, for example, I've been raised mm. with Christ, therefore put to death. So that's not just a, it's separated from me and removed, but there's an active part that I get to play by God's grace in engaging with some of the parts of my personality that I might be able to, in God's kindness, shift over time mm. in ways that help me to relate better to the mm. work that I do. Kirsty, let's come to you. And uh, you're an organisational psychologist and you've just finished your Master's on the subject of clergy resilience. And, That's right. Um, and you surveyed a whole lot of us. Yes, 277 of you. Thank you to oh. everyone who participated. <laughs> I, well, I, I was one. <laughs> on, on how we were managing, how we were coping, how we could be more resilient. Um, well, tell us, just give us a bit of an overview of what you found out. Do you know, yeah. Some of it would be stuff you'd expected and some of it would be stuff you didn't expect, I'm imagining. Yeah, yeah. look, it, it was very interesting because at, at the base level, it was stuff that we expected. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in terms of coming at it from a Christian perspective, the things we found were the things that we already suspected having thought about it from mm -hmm. a biblical perspective. Yeah. So... But, but for... For our benefit, what are some of those things? Yeah, yeah I sure. Mean, let's just, sure. Let's okay. just... So that we were looking at we were looking at resilience and well being mm -hmm. for people who are engaged in in ministry. So um, people who are chaplains, people who are working in um, pastoral ministry as well. And what we found we're, we're studying resilience in terms of reflection, and rather than just looking at ref at resilience per se, we're looking at what what, what is it that helps build, helps strengthen resilience. Mm -hmm. And we found that um, reflection is a good thing mm -hmm. to help build resilience and well-being, but not just reflection. We really need people to move beyond thinking about what's going on mm -hmm. and just considering the, the situation that they're in. We need them to come to a point of insight. Of self insight. These two terms, self reflection and self insight, just mm -hmm. reading through your thesis, they came up again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Can you differentiate between the two categories for me? Yeah. Yes, sure. So, reflection is um, thinking about our behaviours and our feelings, think it's um, considering the situations that we might be mm -hmm. in. Um, it's looking back looking back at what we've experienced mm -hmm. and how we've behaved in those mm -hmm. situations. Whereas insight is the next step in that, if you like. It's thinking through, well, why did I behave in those sorts of ways? What are the triggers that might have caused me to feel that certain way or to behave in that certain way? And actually start to develop um, self-knowledge understanding why I behave in a certain way that I do, why I engage in the sort, sort of coping mechanisms mm. that, I, that I engage in when I'm faced with adversity and struggle mm. in ministry. Do you want to make that concrete for us, Paul, as you've, as, I mean, as Kirsty was well, Yeah, speaking. I mean, I think that um, in a sense that's kind of what the journey for me has been as I've come out the other side of burnout, right? Mm -hmm. So to realise, for example, um, that I was in a ministry situation where 
Um, I uh, was deeply committed to other people's well-being mm -hmm. and good. And that means if someone came to me with a problem, I felt automatically bound by the gospel to try and help them out and look after them, mm. which often meant that I would volunteer to do all sorts of things mm. to help them out. Um, uh, <laughs> I had to learn that there were things about me. I jumped into that space in some ways to soothe my own stress and anxiety about the situation, to try and make mm. myself feel better and useful in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to see that actually by jumping in like that, I was actually often robbing people of responsibility Mm. For, for doing something about their own problem. So I wasn't helping them. I was doing something that had a Christian label on it, yep. but actually was probably just to soothe my own stress about hearing deeply distressing things about people's lives. Yep. And so I had these pattern of behaviours and habits that had, I had Christian language that placed over the top of it to make it all good. And I had to actually learn it wasn't healthy for me and it wasn't healthy for them, which then gave me, started to open up other avenues about how might I respond to somebody when they're in a difficult pastoral situation. What are my responsibilities? What are their responsibilities? And how do I engage well in that mm, space? Mm. Can, can you talk, um, Kirsty, I, I want to come in detail to kind of what do we do to get ourselves out of the situations. Mm. But before we get to that, just... What are some of them? Did you did you work out anything about some of the, some of the more common things that cause me stress and cause me to burn out and things mm. like that? Yeah. Yeah. So this the study um, was looking at a range of different mm -hmm. what we call adversities or mm -hmm. stresses um, in ministry, and we looked at personal sort of stresses, things that happen just within your family. Mm -hmm. um, but then we're also thinking through what are the specific things that happen within ministry? Mm -hmm. So trying to help people deal with mm -hmm. all sorts of pastoral issues, um, be they marriage breakups or all sorts of other things that go on. But then there's also this intersection where your personal life and your ministry role intersect. Yep. And there were a number of different adversities or stresses that happen for, for people who are involved in ministry in that that where where those two groups that makes overlap. it that makes it more complex if somebody's a, a professional counselor where they can be more detached exactly and so we see a very unique set of stressors that happen for people who are in ministry mm. um, Paul in our pre-conversation you were talking about it's not so much volume of work, but particular... How did you put it? Uh, uh, this is my own language. Kirsty can kind of put more technical language on this. But um, I think it's not the volume of work, but it's my emotional relationship to the work that I'm actually doing. So when I'm doing any kind of work where I feel like the task is too big and I don't have the resources to meet that, I keep I experience challenge as a barrier, as an adversity, as a frustration, as a disappointment. I get angry about it. I get you know it's all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, you know you know sometimes I encounter a little problem and I I see there's this thing over here and I can help this person get involved and all of a sudden we kind of a solution to that and that actually breaks open and we find another way of doing something that's better for everybody. That's kind of when I tackle a problem and actually engage with it and make progress. Uh, then I feel like I'm winning, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. Um, I think that sense of winning or making progress is really significant in terms of your own relationship to your ministry and environment. So if you keep getting confronted by problem after problem after problem where you feel like you have no way of fixing the problem mm. and you don't have the resources and you're understaffed and all of that kind of stuff, you just you get to the point where even little barriers, you start to perceive them as gigantic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was in a conversation a couple of months ago with um, at, at the Nexus conference, and one of the, uh, the statements that was made there was, evangelism is not harder than it was 20 years ago. It's just a different kind of hard. Um, but the overall task of ministry, do you think it's harder? Do you think it's getting worse? Do you think this is... I mean, is it exactly... Are we just the same as we were 20 years ago, or are the more complex life stresses for the person in ministry? Then. I mean, I think, like, um, I, this is not a universal context. I think certainly in our context in Sydney, there are compliance issues in terms of uh, government regulations around child protection, all of that. It's actually all good stuff. Yeah. But the level of 
paperwork, engagement, compliance issues, I think, are much more complicated mm. than we were aware of 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's, a, there's that kind of level of stuff. I mean, I feel like there's a pressure on me to be brilliant at preaching, brilliant at um, uh, counselling stuff, brilliant at all the admin details, yeah. and I can't be brilliant at all those things. Well, you can't. <laughs> uh, and actually, the admin details keep getting more and more complicated. They do. And the amount of time, it feels like the amount of time that is expected yeah. of me to spend doing that yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> it just grows and grows. I, I think it really does grow and grow. And I think too, um, I, I personally wonder actually how much our involvement in social media really doesn't help us. Um, if, you, if you've got the friends that keep posting about how things are going fantastically in your ministry, in their in ministry, ministry, sorry. And mine's and not going then, as well. And I've just had this week where I've kind of encountered this and this and this and this. That comparison thing then has an impact on the way that I perceive my own ministry and think about what's going on in my own space, right? So um, I suspect that we have more successful other people in our faces, which is another driver in terms of my own perception of how I'm going, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the... I think it was in your paper, but maybe it was a, a conversation I've had the last couple of days, but did, just the issue of guilt and feeling guilt about how I how I approach that. What, what's going on there? Yeah. Uh, that wasn't in my paper. No, no, sorry. Um, it must have been <laughs> but, a conversation I yeah. had the last couple of days. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think that that, that sense of uh, guilt, there, there's a difference in terms of guilt and shame that right. we might experience. And there's been a fair bit of research that's been done on the similarities and differences between mm -hmm. guilt and shame. Um, I think that there's other people have written quite a bit about that within the ministry context. Yep. Um, I, I don't know how that plays out in terms of your own experience. Mm. Um, I mean, so help me, cause the, you, what's the, technically what would be the difference between guilt and shame? <laughs> There's a bit of debate about yeah, right. it yeah, 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 as yeah. to whether, whether or not um, it's something that is owned by you or owned by others. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I think um, I was thinking you know, what you said about social media. You know, yeah. in that mm -hmm. I, I I see somebody else doing well, um, and I feel guilty that I can't make it all happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities, aren't there? Uh, if you if you start to look around the world and go, what are other people doing? And I mean, the you know the internet brings the whole world into my lounge yeah. room, doesn't it? Uh, Everywhere I look, there are people who are doing better than I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, and particularly, I think, in a comparison kind of driven space that we live in, it becomes, I mean, it's very quick for me to go, oh, I should be better at that. And, oh, I should be better at that. And, you know, the stuff yeah. you were talking about before, oh, I should be a better preacher. I need to invest time in that. Yeah. I should be better with people. I need to invest time in reading and thinking yeah. about that. I should be better at helping, you know. I need to read um, more books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to watch more videos. I need to read more yeah. books. I need to listen to more podcasts. I need yeah. to get better educated. I need to get the work I, done. I just need more. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of everything. Well, we're all digging around for the resources, aren't we? Yeah. I think we've talked a bit about the demands and we're looking for the resources that we can engage Entry. with to yeah. keep us moving forward. But I think we were talking a little bit earlier about the differences between seeing the demands that we have on us as a hindrance as opposed to a challenge. Mm -hmm. And when we constantly are seeing these stresses as more and more hindrances stopping us from going where we need to go, that, that can lead us down a negative mm. spiral. But when we start to think through, okay, well, how can this be a challenge for us? How can we reset our, our minds around where is this taking us? We can start to see the opportunities in mm. the things that... So there's an interesting us. psychological reframing that you can do by God's grace inside yourself around things that you experience, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And so that reframing process is actually mm. really significant mm. in terms of resilience. Mm. And, and that's what you're talking about, isn't it, with the self-reflection and self-insight? Uh, not, not so much that, that process of reframing, although that might be one of the coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that you use. But in terms of ref reflection and insight, where we're getting at is actually thinking through what is the situation that I'm in at the moment? What are the demands that I'm mm -hmm. facing? And how am I actually coping with them? What, what, what are the coping methods that I'm using mm -hmm. to really um, to get through the situation? Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that people who reflect and gain insight on their coping methods are actually have stronger well-being and, and stronger resilience mm -hmm. as well. 
So I'm imagining there are some people listening to us for whom they think, okay, self-reflection, self-insight, got that. And there'll be others who say, what do you mean? I find it difficult to... Uh... <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So part of this means is, is some people can do it quite naturally in and of themselves. Um, yep. But for a lot of us, it's more about having somebody help you think through the situation and help you as as an objective observer to see perhaps are there patterns in the way that you tend to respond to difficulties and have you got have you got stuck in a set of coping strategies or coping methods that you haven't actually expanded your coping strategies that you haven't made the most of all of the resources that are available to you um, can you nuance the sort of methods that you use and in the research that I was looking at, I was specifically looking at uh, what's called religious coping methods. Mm -hmm. And what we found there was that a collaborative religious coping methods are the, are the strongest ones, the ones that for the, the ministers that were engaged in the, pro, in the study, they um, had much stronger well-being and stronger resilience when they engaged in collaborative religious coping. And uh, there was um, collaborative religious coping some of them were kind of the way Protestants would do it, and then some of them were other kind of ways. Do you want to just kind of give us a bit of a, more of a structure of what... I mean, there's a term that I'm not that familiar with, the collaborative religious just coping. coping yeah. Can yeah. you yeah. just kind of put that into layman's language yeah. for you? So the collaborative religious coping is uh, working with God, with God, to solve my problems, so to get through the difficulties. So acknowledging he's in control and yet I bear some responsibility. Absolutely. So there are those two components to it. So I work with God, um, but I'm, I'm doing things like recognising that God is in control, God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. Can you give me, can you work, give me a situation, <laughs> tell me, tell me uh, the kind of person you've talked at and put it into those categories. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, not so much kind of. I mean, give us a, well, a, a real a real life scenario. A, yeah. Example. Well, so I, the sorts of things that you might see here is um, uh, uh, perhaps Paul is a better person to actually give you some some deep insights into it. But um, as I'm going through a difficult pastoral mm -hmm. matter, mm -hmm. um, my natural inclination might be to um, try to be there to provide lots of time, lots of support. Um, and as I'm going through that, that, that will be a good thing. But also to think through how, what, what is God's role in this? Certainly there are things that I can be doing, but what more do I need to do to recognise that God is at play in this situation? Um, so that I do make sure that I'm praying, that I'm engaging with God throughout this recognising that he is sovereign. Mm -hmm. Paul? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's very interesting, isn't it? I, one of my observations is that um, in my job, when I was getting burnt out, I felt like there were lots and lots of different areas of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, there were some areas of responsibility that were very clear how to solve them and others that yeah. weren't. Uh, but if one that could be solved was screaming at me, that gave me an excuse to ignore all the other ones, <laughs> <laughs> for example. Yep. Um, and so there were, there were things about kind of accepting the fact that actually... Um, I was probably using some things to run away from other problems. And so part of the process then was actually being able to stop and go, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed to acknowledge this, but, uh, you know, God tells me that he already knows what I'm like. Yep. The gospel tells me that I am forgiven and therefore my relationship with my sin is kind of different. I can now acknowledge that actually I'm running, I'm using this thing to run away from that problem over there. Yeah. Whereas... Uh, there are certain things about me that I need to tackle or engage. Yeah. But acknowledging that I need God's help in working through that and asking him to help me start to find different ways of maybe being, you know, less avoidant of certain yeah. tasks mm -hmm. in my job. Uh, the first step, though, is actually acknowledging I'm afraid of that task. I don't feel very good at it. I'm worried, therefore, about what God thinks of me and about what other people think of me. Mm -hmm. How does the gospel address that complex of issues in such a way that I can start to investigate who I am and how I relate there, on the back of which I can then change the way that I interact in a particular set of circumstances. Thank you for that. That's, that's really helpful in terms of explaining as you're going through that, you're reflecting on it, you're coming to 
an insight around how you tend to behave and then trying to adjust the coping methods that you use yep. throughout it. And that's what we're seeing through the, this research is that that leads to better wellbeing and stronger resilience. So you had two things, what God thinks of me and what other people think of yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the other people thinking of me, that's a big thing, isn't it? I think that's a huge thing in ministry, actually. Uh, and I think, like, we all know what the right answer is, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing to an audience of one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So, look, you know, we all, uh, for those of us who are in ministry, we preach about it constantly to other people. Um, there's the reality of there is this truth that I believe to be true. Part of what we're talking about, I think, with reflection and insight is working out how does that truth actually relate to me as a specific human being? Mm -hmm. So where are my particular struggles with what other people think of me? You know, when am I most vulnerable? Is it when someone asks me to do something and I say no to them and then they feel grumpy with me? Yeah. Is it when I get up to preach because everybody's watching? Uh, is it when I'm actually in the parish council space because they're the other senior people in the church and what they think? Of like, different ones of us will actually feel different mm. sensitivities in different places, mm -hmm. I think. And part of the reflection insight thing is starting to get honest with yourself what are the particular circumstances that cause you to have real problems in this space? Mm. And then how do you start to think? And I think you need a, you need a, 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 you talked about collaborative before. I actually, for me, it's been really helpful having someone have external friends uh, for a time in counselling. Uh, I'm now, I get professional supervision in my task mm -hmm. at the moment where someone comes from outside and just asks kind of pointed questions yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about me or whatever, but in a safe space where I can actually, rather than just avoiding those things, start to think concretely about them mm. and then try to, well, what, what's a different way that I could approach that? What sorts of things can I say to myself to overcome my fears and to actually do the thing that I'm avoiding or whatever it is in that space? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you raised in your paper um, the issue of rumination and mm. brooding mm -hmm. and, and it, it, it sounded to me, and I might have read this wrong, but it sounded to me like, that was one of the areas that you hadn't really expected to... to um, maybe just tell us what you found. Yeah, yeah, no, so there's a fair amount of literature that speaks to rumination and to brooding. Um, and what we, we did expect to find some form of rumination and brooding, so we... Um, we included a what, measure of it. So what, to is, study. It, what is it? For, for so first? it's it's a persistent um, return of thought around a negative situation or negative thought yeah. patterns around yourself around the situation. Yeah. So and it's persistent. Um, it, it you really um, perseverate over that same issue, and so what we're finding is that there's there's a much higher likelihood that you will. Um, find yourself ruminating if you engage in reflection. Uh, so it's actually a danger of reflection mm -hmm. is that you become ruminative and if you become ruminative there's a much higher likelihood that you'll fall into depression. Yeah. So we don't we don't want to go. So there's there. kind of a spiral <laughs> that. Yeah. I mean, whereas if I don't reflect at all. Yeah, yeah, you're safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. So we we don't want to. Maybe other consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've got to do the right kind of reflection. Absolutely, that's just it. So when we're saying so help reflection, me to do that. <laughs> yeah. So what the 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 trick is that we actually want re reflection to result in insight. So. We're not just reflecting about the same thing over and over. We want the, the reflection to be about how am I coping with this situation? How can I change? Um, what's a future action-oriented approach? So that it starts to get to this point where, so for example, if you've got somebody helping, you know, a, a, a psychologist or um, a mentor or a coach, um, that person can help you to have the goal, a, a goal or something yep. future oriented to change the way that you adapt or the, sorry, that you um, respond to those sorts of situations rather than always finding yourself thinking about the negative and thinking, well, this always happens to me or why does it, you know, why am I always the one that struggles with these things? Yeah. 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 Thanks so much for coming in and talking to me. Yeah. Thanks, Dominic.
My guests have been, uh, well, Paul Grimman, Dean of Students at Moore Theological College, and Kirsty Bucknell. Hey, just before you go, Kirsty, you've just yes. finished your Masters, yes. just about to do your PhD. Yes. What's the topic of the PhD? Oh, it's very exciting. So we're actually looking at designing a program to help people strengthen their resilience in ministry. So the next three years we'll be uh, designing the program, implementing it and seeing if it actually works. Works. Great. Well, we will look forward to getting you back and hearing more about... I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful service that you're doing for those of us in Christian ministry to help strengthen all of us. Uh, and so we're really appreciative. And so thanks very much. Thank you. And thanks very much to both of you for joining us on The Pastor's Heart today. Thanks, Dominic.